Hey, I know you. You're that jaywalking punk anarchist. Hello, this is the Radical Reviewer. Well, howdy there, Internet people. It's Bo again. Oh, hey, Bo. Hey, Rad. We're taking a look at Common Sense by Thomas Paine, Fall River Press, 1995, originally published in 1776. The key idea of this text is that monarchy is an oppressive tyranny which has no justification for itself, not in history or reason or nature or even scripture, and that if we acknowledge that the rule of kings is unjustified, and if we look at the state of the world today, the today of 1776 obviously, we see that America is so uniquely placed in population and resources and global position that the time is right for American independence and removing the oppressive burden of tyrannical monarchy. Gather thy muskets, ye patriots! Is the time not nigh to water the tree of liberty with the blood of the tyrants? John Adams said, without the pen of pain, the sword of Washington would be wielded in vain. Pain has been described as the spiritual and philosophical founder of the revolution, and therefore the United States. Let's take a look at the text in depth. Chapter 1, on the origin and design of government in general, with concise remarks on the English Constitution. This chapter is about the creation of government and discussing the English monarchy specifically. Paine starts by defining and distinguishing society from government. He states, Society is produced by our wants and government by our wickedness. The former promotes our happiness positively by uniting our affections and the latter negatively by restraining our vices. Society in every state is a blessing, but government, even in its best state, is but a necessary evil. Okay, so society is made up of our positive inclinations like wanting to work together and setting up a food bank or throwing a party, doing a bucket brigade when your neighbor's house is on fire or whatever. And government is established to deal with our negative vices, thievery, assault, murder, and such. Interestingly, with some slight word changes, you could easily come away from this with a Marxist critique. Just trade the word society for commune or something, and the word government for the state. You know, the commune promotes our happiness, and the state restrains our vices. Easy now. Calling the philosophical founder of the revolution a Marxist might get you into trouble with a lot of leading conservatives today. Of course, Paine was called the foremost fighter for world democracy and the chief propagandist and agitator of the revolution in 1937 by the Communist Party. So maybe, maybe, there's some validity to the way you're reading it. I just don't know that I would go telling too many people that. Oh, really? The foremost fighter for world democracy? Damn, that's quite the title. Well, next Payne explains what he sees as the main goal of government. He states, Security being the true design and end of government, it unanswerably follows that whatever form thereof appears most likely to ensure it to us with the least expense and greatest benefit is preferable to all others. Okay, so security at the best quality and cheapest price is best. And a little later in the chapter, he reaffirms that the function of government is freedom and security. Now, I can obviously give this a capitalist libertarian reading, saying that this means that the government should only provide for a police and a military to secure private property rights and nothing else. You know, the government who governs least governs best, or whatever. But really, what is a better provider of security? A capitalist libertarian model with a police force and that's it? Or a leftist libertarian model with a substantial social safety net? providing public housing and public works projects, unemployment insurance, and the like. You know, freedom and security not meaning free markets and police, but freedom as in freedom from coercion and unjust hierarchies, and security as in providing for the social good, each according to need and all that. It's almost like Paine's anti-authoritarian, anti-tyranny, enlightenment worldview, although it could easily justify a capitalist libertarian stance, could just as easily justify a leftist libertarian stance. 
Something tells me this is going to be a repeated theme here. What do you think, Bo? Later in life, Payne advocated a lot of variants of the things you just mentioned. It's an interesting thing, because today's conservatives have kind of laid claim to the founders, and many seem to believe that the founders were as conservative as conservatives of today, and that's not entirely accurate at all. Um, many founders were more progressive than a lot of Republicans today. Payne definitely believed that government was best when it governed less. He also believed that people could organize and do good on their own if they so chose. Oh yeah, true, true. Payne then discusses the origin of government in human history, starting with prehistoric humans, stating, in this state of natural liberty, society will be their first thought, and not government. But then, as the population grows and people's interests and ability to empathize and work with a larger group becomes more difficult, they will begin to relax in their duty and attachment to each other. And this remissness will point out the necessity of establishing some form of government to supply the defect of moral virtue. Payne continues explaining that the first parliaments gave every man a seat, and the first laws were only regulations with minimal enforcement. But that this direct democracy type government, what Payne calls absolute government, eventually evolved into the larger bureaucratic tyrannical governments. Comparing these first governments to the latter governments, Payne states, Absolute governments, though the disgrace of human nature, have this advantage with them that they are simple. If the people suffer, they know the head from which their suffering springs, known likewise the remedy, and are not bewildered by the variety of causes and curses. But the constitution of England is so exceedingly complex that the nation may suffer for years together without being able to discover in which part the fault lies. Surely this is a problem with bureaucracy, but as we've seen, there have been several thinkers post-enlightenment who have written on maintaining and expanding the benefits of democracy while minimizing or even eliminating the bureaucratic aspects. Next, Payne gives a brief breakdown of England's government, and he argues that Although the new republican aspects move England towards freedom, the king and the aristocracy remain a tyrannical restraint on their freedom. Complaining about the checks and balances of the English government, Payne argues that a constitution that has a check against the king, but also gives the king the ability to reject bills, is to argue that the king is wise enough to know which laws to reject, and yet not wise enough to be free from checks from those who are supposedly not wise enough to know which laws to pass. And this is kind of true in the current American government as well with presidential veto power. And Payne states, How came the king, by a power which the people are afraid to trust, and always obliged to check? Basically, although some aspects of a government might have the power to block or postpone or check actions within the government, if there is an imbalance in power, and power is ultimately what rules in politics, then that aspect of government with the most power will always win out in the end. It's one of the paradoxes of government in general. We feel the necessity for government because we believe people can't run their own lives and that they will infringe on others because people are corruptible. But then we put more power in fewer and fewer hands to protect us from ourselves, and the people who make up the government are often just as flawed, if not more flawed, than the average person because those who seek positions in government are often seeking power that corrupts. By the time we create a perfect government, we won't need one because society will have perfected itself. Chapter 2 of monarchy and hereditary succession. This chapter is about how hereditary monarchy is unjustifiable. Strangely, Payne starts the chapter by arguing that oppression is often the consequence, but seldom or never means of riches. And though Aravis will preserve a man from being necessarily poor, it generally makes him too tumorous to be wealthy. Essentially saying that wealth and poverty is seldom caused by oppression and greed. Which... Nah, I totally disagree with this. 
it's little quotes like this that really point to Paine's more capitalist libertarian worldview. Or to be more generous, I'd say that it exposes the naivete of early Enlightenment thinking. Right? <laughs> For as brilliant as Paine was, there are certainly moments where you could tell he didn't have it all figured out just yet. I mean, none of us do, and we certainly have a, the benefit of a few hundred years of history on him. But he certainly saw poverty as inevitable. It was something that was going to happen. It should be lessened as much as possible, but it was always going to be there. From his period in time, I mean, it's not an unforgivable view. The world powers were fighting over commodities and resources daily. It's not like he could really envision a system of distribution that would take care of everyone. Yeah, fair enough. In 1776, the Industrial Revolution was only just beginning. The French Revolution hadn't happened yet. Marx and Perdon weren't on the scene yet. Perhaps he just wasn't ready to critique the tyrants, which are the capitalist class. Anyway, Paine goes on to explain that kings are not justified in nature or in scripture. And he goes over a brief history of the Gideons and Samuel and King David and such, Essentially, the various instances where God tells the Jewish people that it is a sin to have any kings outside of God himself. His use of religious imagery, something that's always fascinated me. You know, he wasn't an overly religious man, but he knew to meet people where they were. Well, that's true. I could see that. In fact, in the intro to this version of the text, it talks about how Paine's writing style was much more blunt and accessible compared to other writers of the time. Next, discussing the hereditary aspect of monarchy, Paine states, All men, being originally equals, no one by birth could have a right to set up his own family in perpetual preference to all others forever. And though himself might deserve some decent degree of honors of his contemporaries, yet his descendants might be far too unworthy to inherit them. Now, certainly this is a critique of hereditary succession in monarchy, but this can easily be applied to inheritance and ownership of resources and land and means and production and stuff under capitalism as well. Like, folks might think that a noble or compassionate general would make a good king, but his shitty brat of a son? I don't think so. And likewise, maybe you think that some person who saved and invented and innovated and clawed and trampled and cannibalized the competition to become a successful business owner deserves their business. If you're watching me, you probably disagree with this, but for the sake of argument, let's say you think that's fine. Still, we can probably all agree that a person who has handed the reins of a company out of inheritance is not deserving of that degree of honors, as Payne puts it. Next, critiquing the justification of a king existing at all, Payne states, This is supposing the present race of kings in the world to have had a honorable origin. We should find the first of them nothing better than the principal ruffian of some restless gang. And again, yeah, this most certainly applies to kings, but I could easily apply this logic to capitalists as well. In fact, this particular line reminds me of a classic anti-capitalist comic, where it says, Get off this estate. Uh, what for? Because it's mine. Where did you get it? From my father. Where did he get it? From his father. And where did his father get it? He fought for it. Well, we'll fight you for it. Showing that, just like with kings, most so-called legitimate claims to property or resources or capital or whatever have their roots in violent conquest. Payne then gives some examples of how perhaps the first king was chosen, by lot, by election, or by usurpation. He argues that if it was by lot, chosen at random, or elected, either option sets the precedent that kings should always be chosen by lot or elected, and not by hereditary succession. And if it was by usurpation, well, we should just find that option indefensible. And Payne concludes, the plain truth is that the antiquity of English monarchy will not bear looking into. Payne goes on to explain that the life of a king is so distant from the citizenry that it makes a king unfit to rule. He states, Men who look upon themselves born to reign and others to obey soon grow insolent. The world they act in differs so materially from the world at large 
that they have but little opportunity of knowing its true interests, and when they succeed to the government, are frequently the most ignorant and unfit of any throughout the dominions. And I'm sure you know what I'm probably going to say now, probably starting to sound like a broken record at this point, but the same could be said for capitalists. What right does a multi-millionaire CEO or stockholder or board member have to have a say over the lives of the employees, when the multi-millionaire's lives are so totally alien to that of the average employee? I think articles like this one about multi-billionaire Jeff Bezos building a homeless shelter after destroying a tax bill to help the homeless really sends this message home. I'd go even further. The current system allows for a different kind of distance. It's not a physical one, it's one of means. You know, if you look at the size of the stimulus checks that went out, there is nobody even remotely close to the citizenry that would believe that those amounts would help sustain people. And it's a marked difference between the average citizen and the ruling class here. Yeah, no joke. A year of pandemic and we're supposed to get by with one payment of $1,200? It would almost be funny if it wasn't so disgusting. Next, Payne challenges the claim that hereditary monarchy helps protect a country from civil war by giving a brief history of all the times the kings of England were killed, usurped, overthrown, and various other fights over the crown. And Payne concludes the chapter stating, The nearer any government approaches to a republic, the less business there is for a king. The more worth is one honest man to society and in the sight of God, than all the crowned ruffians that ever lived. And you know what? The same could be said for capital. Chapter three, thoughts on the present state of American affairs. It is from this point on that the text focuses more on 1770s America and the fight for independence than discussing tyranny and monarchy in general. Looking at how America has benefited from the relationship with England, Paine argues that this will not always be the case not economically or in a protection sense, because England will, at the end of the day, be worried about the economic well-being and security of England, even if it's done at America's expense. Next, Paine addresses the paternalistic argument and retorts, Europe and not England is the parent country of America. Which makes perfect sense. It's not like the people coming to America from Germany or Sweden saw England as their motherland. Yeah, me being me, I've always loved this part. I've always loved this part. The idea that from the very, very beginning, the United States, America, was never supposed to be about one culture. From the beginning, it was supposed to be about accepting cultures blending together, and that that was what was going to make us unique. Discussing the risks of colony status, Payne argues that America should not be in a position as a colony where it would have to follow England into war, risking its own destruction. And also, economically, America shouldn't limit itself to England's wishes. He states, Dependence on Great Britain tends directly to involve this continent in European wars and quarrels, and sets us at variance with nations who would otherwise seek our friendship, and against whom we have neither anger nor complaint. As Europe is our market for trade, we ought to form no partial connection with any part of it. And then, and I suppose this is maybe just because of the language and mindset of the time, Payne goes on a small tirade about how America was placed on the globe so empty of inhabitants and rich in resources and so far from England, specifically by the Almighty himself, because America was designed by God to be the greatest nation of all, and all that. I have to believe this section is more his attempt to meet the reader where they're at than convey his own ideas. He's trying to speak their ideas. Payne was a propagandist. I have to believe he knew what he was doing here. The, the language in it is so contrary to so many of his known beliefs. I, I have to believe that this is just pure propaganda on his part. Yeah, Bo, you're probably right. I suppose this is just one of those things where a reader would need to be more familiar with the author's greater body of work to really appreciate it. 
After this, Payne argues that the attacks England had committed in America, specifically the massacre at Lexington, had ruined any chances of reconciliation between England and America. Next, Payne names some of the reasons why it would destroy America to remain a colony. First, the King of England would not allow America to pass any laws that would be contrary to the goals of England. And secondly, that the King's control over America hangs by a thread, which makes immigration, trade, and treaties with other nations very difficult. Lastly, arguing that it's hard to see the road to independence without any kind of plan to get there, Payne lays out how he recommends an independent American government should work. And he argues for things like an annual assembly with equal representation, dividing each colony into districts with at least 30 delegates per district, creating a congress of at least 390 members, and that the president should be chosen by having a colony chosen at random and then Congress voting for a president from that colony, and that laws should be passed with a three-fifths majority and things like that. And Payne concludes, He that will promote discord under a government so equally formed as this would have joined Lucifer in his revolt. This is what makes the work so notable. Understanding it in its timeline is uh, important. Fighting had already started. At this point, the colonists they were rebelling. They wanted reform. The idea of independence hadn't taken root yet. It was Payne's writing that crystallized that rebellion into a spirit of revolution. For sure. Now, going over piece by piece in detail, Payne's plan for an American government might provide some interesting insights, but I think it's perhaps more fruitful to simply say that Payne was pretty egalitarian for his time. He was critical of checks and balances, as we've seen. And in the following chapter, he argues for large and equal representation. Also, according to the timeline of Payne's life added at the beginning of the text, we see that while a bunch of wealthy slave owners in the U.S. were writing the Constitution, Payne was busy writing radical literature in England, and then getting chased out of England on sedition charges, and going off to France to be part of the French Revolution. So, suffice it to say, he would probably not be too pleased with the government that the U.S. ended up with. It's definitely worth noting also that Payne argued against slavery before he ever put pen to paper arguing for an independent American nation. And to insert a very overt plug, one of the uh, first videos that's going to be released on the second channel is a deep dive into Payne's life and his revolutionary activities in Europe. Oh, that sounds cool. Folks should definitely check that out. Make sure to plug it again at the end so we don't forget. Anyway, back to the text. Payne concludes the chapter arguing that, It is infinitely wiser and safer to form a constitution of our own in a cool, deliberate manner while we have it in our power than to trust such an interesting event to time and chance. Essentially, by not forming an independent government now while the time is right, is to allow someone to take hold of the confusion and panic of a last-minute independence to put in a tyrannical, oppressive government. Chapter 4 of The Present Ability of America with some miscellaneous reflections. This chapter is about... Gather thy muskets, ye patriots! As the time... Yeah, 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 we get the idea. To start, Payne argues that everyone he's talked to in England and America say that American independence is bound to happen eventually. And Payne, of course, argues that the American population, the resources, the debts, the distance from Europe, everything is such that the time for American independence is now. Next, Payne argues that America needs to create a navy, that no country has a coast and resources like America does. The countries of Europe have coasts, but not enough resources, while Russia has resources, but not enough coast. And also, England's navy ain't even that scary, because even though it's huge, it's too spread out protecting England's various interests around the world. You know, Payne's often uh, underestimated in regards to his military forethought. His plea for a strong navy was just one of many examples where his military ideas were actually more insightful than many of the generals that were made famous by the revolution. 
Next, critiquing America's federal government a decade before it was written, Payne states, I have heretofore likewise mentioned the necessity of a large and equal representation, and there is no political matter which more deserves our attention. A small number of electors or a small number of representatives are equally dangerous, but if the number of representatives be not only small but unequal, the danger is increased. Payne is certainly calling for a representative government that is more democratic than what the United States ended up with, but I think that the same could be said not only for a small and unequal representation in the U.S. government, but also for this small and unequal representation found in most capitalist enterprises. But I think I've belabored that point enough. Finally, Payne lists various reasons America must declare independence. First, America is subject to Britain for mediation in any wars regarding Europe, which sucks. Second, no other country would offer America assistance if America's goals were simply to mend the colonial relationship with England. Third, if America tries to stay a colony of England, other nations will see America's behavior as rebellious. But if America declares its desire for independence, it will win sympathy from other nations. And fourth, it will be easier for America to make peace with all of Europe than with England specifically. And Payne concludes, Under our present denomination of British subjects, we can neither be received nor heard abroad. The custom of all courts is against us, and will be so, until, by an independence, we take rank with other nations. CONCLUSION This text was published 59 years before Democracy in America. 64 years before What is Property, 72 years before the Communist Manifesto, 83 years before On Liberty, and 116 years before the Conquest of Bread. A great split has formed since the early days of the Enlightenment, the capitalist libertarian right and the communist libertarian left. Now, these two sides greatly disagree on the role and function of society, of government, of the state. They disagree on how to provide freedom and security. Hell, they often disagree on what these terms even mean. However, their goals, liberté, égalité, fraternité, anti-authoritarianism, freedom, democracy, they all have their roots in Enlightenment thinking. And I think it's very important to take a look at the original Enlightenment texts, such as this one, Common Sense by Thomas Paine to understand what were the original philosophies and goals of the Enlightenment, of liberalism, that have laid the groundwork for the libertarian right and libertarian left theories that we have today. But that's just me. What do you think, Bo? You know, I don't, uh, I don't get into the, the economic debates that often. I try to focus on encouraging people to be anti-authoritarian. I think that's that's more important. I think the economics will work itself out later. I think Payne does a really good job of selling anti-authoritarianism. So I certainly think he's worth reading. I think he's worth. Uh, I think he's still useful today. But anyway, it's just a thought. Cool, cool, and, and thank you, Bo, for recommending this book to me, and thank you so much for helping me tackle the text. And as always, I'd like to thank my wonderful patrons. Your tremendous support has allowed me to get dog insurance and to support other creators I couldn't otherwise support. You're helping me to arm myself in the battle against the tyranny that is the corporate capitalist YouTube algorithm, which is really awesome. I appreciate you folks a lot. And if you like what I do here and you want to support the show, you can go to patreon.com slash radical reviewer. And if you're interested in radical theory, looking for a book recommendation or whatever, you can get your radical reviews here with our radical reviewer. Thanks for watching. And the answer to their 1984 charity is 1776! 1776! 17! No, God!
No, God, please, no, no.